Okay, folks, this is Beginner OSPF Part 2. This is going to be a four-part series. We did Part 1 last week. Uh, today, you can see our topology up here. We've got four routers connected to a backbone router, so five routers in total. Four on the left, one on the right. I gave you the configs in your email, so just put this together and then paste all these configs in. And if, uh, if you haven't done so already, that's not a problem. You can, you can catch up or uh, just rewatch the video when it gets popped up on YouTube. Uh, we are recording, so uh, you don't need to write everything down right away. Okay, how many of you have the topology up and running? So you should have your console windows up. Mute your mics, please. And on the right side, you can see your chat window. Just type in there that you are ready. Okay, and so while you guys are getting ready, let me just give you a quick preview of what's going to happen today. We're going to set up OSPF on four of the routers. Uh, so last week we did two routers. This week we'll do uh, four. We're going to see how the OSPF database differs when you have four versus two. Uh, we're going to change the router ID just to see uh, what, we can, what we can do with that. We're going to change some of the default values. We're going to look at... Um, changing like the priority. I think we did the priority last week. Um, may change some of the timers and some other default values. We're going to look into the passive interface command. That's our connection from R4 to BB1. We don't want to be transmitting out OSPF to Backbone 1. So we'll do that. We'll also look at default information originate. So R4 to BB1 is our connection to the internet. We want the rest of our network to be able to reach the internet without having to go on every router and type uh, IP route all zeros, all zeros. So with one command, we can tell the rest of our network how to get out, uh, so to speak. And then if we have time, we may get into some uh, some more stuff. For part three, which will be, I'm guessing it's going to be next week, we're going to have um, multi-area OSPF that's covered in your CCNA. So the new CCNA does do multi-area OSPF. You'll have to know that. Okay, so it looks like everyone is ready. So here we go. Uh, you may want to have the, po the topology on another window, another screen, just so you can look at it. I pretty much have this memorized by heart, so uh, not a problem. Uh, first of all, we want to just make sure you have connectivity from one router to the next, so hop-to-hop -hop connectivity. If you go on router uh, 1, let's say, uh, show CDP neighbor, your interfaces are up. And you should see routers 2 and 3. And if you ping all 255s, your pings will go out your interfaces. And hopefully you get a response back from a dot two and a dot three. So 12.2 and 13.3. Right. And you can go on router 4, do the same thing, show CDP neighbors. You know, ping all 255s. Router 4 is going to get a response back from three routers because we've got a backbone uh, router out there. Normally, this probably wouldn't happen, but uh, we'll just kind of go with it on, on this one. Anyone having any trouble with hop-to-hop -hop connectivity? So if you can't ping the other side, so if you're on router 1 and you can't ping 2 and 3, then you've got to troubleshoot that really quick before continuing on. And for the new members out there, it's uh, customary that you share your screen. So share your screen, just like you see my screen, I've got my terminal window shared. So a couple of you guys have done it, Mark's done it, Christopher's done it. So the rest of you, if, if you're not shy, share your screen. That way we can watch what you're typing. That way, if you have any questions, we could just click on it and uh, see your stuff. Okay, so let's continue. So I haven't started any routing protocols at all. We just have IP addresses. So what we want to do is on R1, let's start OSPF debugging. Now we don't have OSPF running, but uh, you know we will in a second. This just kind of prepares us for that. So debug IP OSPF hellos. And let's debug IP OSPF adjacency ADJ. 
So debug IPOSBFLO will show us uh, the hellos that we send and are receiving. Debug IPOSPF adjacency is who we're being adjacent to. So when we see another router running OSPF, we're going to run through this uh, loading and full and handshaking and all this stuff. And eventually we're going to transfer LSAs, which contain the route information. And we'll be able to see that with this debug. Uh, also in this session, we're going to be a little bit more exact on putting things into OSPF. Actually, we're going to be very exact on this one. So let's show IP interface brief on router one. We just want to see what uh, stuff you're running. So you've got a uh, fast zero zero, fast zero one, and loop back zero. We're going to go conf t. We're going to start up OSPF, router OSPF1. And before we do anything, let's set our router ID. So for those of you guys who are studying, what were the rules for how OSPF picks your router ID? You can type it in chat if you want. Let's see who wins on this one. Okay, CRISPR, he's typed in highest IP address on any interface or loopback address. Correct. Okay, so highest IP on a physical interface. If you have a loopback address, then it's going to take that. Okay. We can override that by putting in a router ID. Router ID is going to win. And router ID doesn't have to be a real IP address. So let me show you what we could do here. Let's make a router ID of 0.0.0.1. Enter. So 0001 is not a real IP address. It's, it's got four numbers, but you can't really have a IP address of that. And we'll see if OSPF will, will take this. So we set our router ID. Now we need to put our interfaces. We need to tell our interface to run OSPF. We're going to be very exact here. And so fast zero, 0, we're going to do 10, 10, 12, 1. And for the mask, we're going to do all zeros. We're going to throw that into area 0. So we're starting OSPF only on fast zero, 0, So we have our debugs running. You can see immediately that right here. Interface fast zero zero is going up. Now, it's not going up like shut, no shut. It's going up for OSPF. So OSPF has started on it. It's now sending a hello, 224005. It's building an LSA, a router LSA. Look at the router ID, 0001. And it's going to constantly send hellos every 10 seconds. And you notice if you wait a little bit, it's finished with the DR BDR election. Now look at this. It elected a BDR, it made itself BDR, and then it promoted itself to the DR. Now if you remember from last week, DR is the guy who handles the replication for the LSAs. He's kind of like the, the referee on the particular link. All right. And here's something interesting, no full neighbors to build network LSA. So we have, last week we talked about the router LSA that was a type 1. We didn't, I don't think we really type, talked about type 2 LSAs. Type 2 LSA is the information, or the LSA that gives you information about the link on Ethernet segments. And for that, we need to have a neighbor. We don't have any neighbors and this is what it told us, no full neighbors. But we'll see how it looks from the, the database side. So let's end out of there and show IP OSPF database. And you can see we have our type 1 LSA, our router LSA 0001. Now I like changing the router ID to 0001 because it makes things easy. I can see immediately right here that this is router 1. And if I want to look at this LSA, I can show IP OSPF database router. 
and this will tell me about this particular LSA. So the router made it, and the router knows how to get to 10, 10, 12, 0. And that's it. I'll start my debugs back up. Show IP interface brief. And then we'll go back into OSPF. So we put FAST00 into OSPF. Now we're going to put FAST01 into OSPF. Exact match, all zeros, area zero. Now you may have noticed that if you look at my screen, before I go into OSPF configuration, I tend to always do a show IP interface brief. That way when I do my configuration, I can kind of, I can just look up here to get my IP addresses. Because I don't want to waste brain cells trying to remember this stuff. All right, so network zero, or a 10, 10, 13, 1, all zeros, area zero. So that's an exact match. Hopefully you have your debugs running. I hit enter. And you're going to see it says fast zero one for OSPF went up. It's sending out hellos on that link. It built an LSA. And then it's going to say electing BDR, then promoting it to DR, and all that good stuff. So we're going to wait a bit. Notice the time that it says that the interface went up for OSPF. On mine, it's 12 seconds. And I'm going to guess at the 52 second mark, something's going to happen right there. DR, BDR election. We elected ourselves as BDR, then we went to DR. So you start off as the BDR and then you pop up to DR. Now why is this significant? Why is it that my link comes up at 12 seconds and then this whole DR, BDR stuff, I got the final message at 52 seconds. How many seconds is that in between? 12 seconds, 52 seconds. It's 40 seconds, okay? So for OSPF on a fast ethernet link, the hellos, hellos happen every 10 seconds and the dead interval is 40 seconds. So your router waited 40 seconds to see if there was another OSPF router on the link. It was very patient. It said, oh, okay, maybe there's another OSPF guy on that link. And if there is, we'll fight for who's DR on this link. There wasn't. And so it made itself BDR and then DR. Okay. Does that make sense to everyone? It waits the 40 seconds to see who else is on the same link. And you can see we are sending hellos out fast zero, 0 and fast zero, 01. And so now I'm going to do show IP interface brief again. My loopback is all ones. And we're going to throw our loopback into OSPF. So network all ones, all zeros, area 0. And you can see from our debugs, interface loopback zero goes up. And you can see what's interesting about this is I'm not sending out hellos on the loopback because OSPF is smart enough to recognize that that loopback is not connected anywhere. It's, uh, we call it a stub. No one's actually there. And so OSPF goes up. I don't need to send a hello out. So it's a little bit smarter than RIP. Actually, it's a lot smarter than, than RIP. So we got that. Let's end out of there. I'm going to show IP OSPF database. And you can see everything's the same except for the link count. The link count has gone to three and my sequence number has gone up to three. So why do you think that sequence number has gone up to three? 
it's actually eight zero 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 and a three at the end. But why why have we gone from from one to three? So when we fired up OSPF on this router, we put the first interface in there. The sequence number it's what keeps track of what's new information and what's old information. So the sequence number went to eight, a whole bunch of zeros and one. You added the second interface, that one turned into a two. When you added the third interface, the two turned into a three. The link count right here is how many links we know about, how many links are we telling the world. So this you should be able to get, I'm just going to stop my debugs for a little bit. If you show IP OSPF interface brief, show IP int BR, you're going to see that you have your router is telling you that you've thrown three interfaces into OSPF. So three interfaces, three links. So if another router comes up with OSPF, you talk to each other, this is the information you're going to tell the other guy. And you can start your debugs again on R1. So debug IP OSPF hello, debug IP OSPF ADJ. So let's go over to router two. We'll keep this in order here. So router two, same thing. Uh, actually, show IP interface brief. We'll keep the debugs running on our R1. We'll, um, we won't have the debugs on R2, just because uh, you know we already have it running on R1. It's comfy. Router OSPF one. Router ID, so we did 0001 on router 1, here we'll do 0002 on router 2. Now if we want to throw these two interfaces on OSPF, so circled in red, 10.10.12.2, 10.10.24.2. We could do it exact. We could do two network statements. We could do it in one network statement if we wanted to. Now we could be really exact, but here we're gonna we're gonna do it easy way. If you look at these two IP addresses, what two parts match in these IP addresses? The ten ten part, right? Now, theoretically, we, we could, you know, this last part also matches, but, you know, for for the CCNA level, 1010 match on the IP address. So what we could do is we could do this. If we want to throw both of these interfaces in in one shot, we could do network 1010 0, 0. And now if we do a question mark, you'll see that uh, we're, we need wildcard bits. So what do you think our wildcard bits would be if we just wanted to match on the first two? Okay, zero, zero. That sounds about right. Now if you did zero, zero and it didn't work, you would just flip it around. But I think zero, zero is a good bet. Throw it into area zero. Type in enter. Now a whole bunch of crap started going, and if you look on R1, R1 just went freaking nuts, didn't it? Right? R1, and you can stop the debugs now. Okay, so life was good until you threw interfaces into OSPF on R2. Looking back at R1, you'll see that for the first time in its life, it received a hello from 0002, sent an immediate hello, look at that, immediate hello. That, that means it didn't wait for the 10 seconds, it just, boom, right away, here's a hello back. Received the DBD, the DBD is a database descriptor. This is kind of like a, um, a Cliff Notes version of what R2 knows about. So it's like, hey man, I know I, I have information about two routes. Do you want them? 
or here's here's a little snippet of what they are you do you already have them you know do I need to send them to you R1 is going to say okay let's let's talk let's let's start talking two way communication we elect a DR BDR now R1's already the DR so it's going to stay the DR there's no preemption or anything like that after that's done we're going to send a DBD back to R2 so it's like hey here's a kind of a preview of what I have and then we start talking we start changing stuff and eventually somewhere down here please mute your mics eventually we're gonna go to full so sending LSA receiving link state all that good stuff so eventually if I show IP OSPF neighbor on R1, you'll see that R2 is full, and R2 is the BDR. Full is what we want. And if we look at the database, show IP OSPF database, you'll see that we have a 0001, 0000002, router 1, router 2. And now we finally have a type 2, an LSA, a network link state, LSA type 2. That's because we have two routers on an Ethernet link that is a DR and BDR. So let's go back to R2. Let's finish it up. We'll throw the loop back into area 0, so network 2222. All zeros, area 0. And if we go back to R1, show IP OSPF database, this link count, now it's three, right here, circled in red, that's three. Before, it was two. You add the, the loop back in there, that was an extra link, two becomes a three. So at the CCNA level, very helpful to know about this, but where this is going to come into play, reading the, the databases and troubleshooting and all that stuff, is going to be CCNP and CCIE. At the CCNA level, they, they want you this basic troubleshooting, setting it up, you know, a little bit of multi-area OSPF. You know, you could throw it, throw in a default route, all this stuff, but it's not going to be too, too nutso. But once you get into CCNP and CCIE, this is where knowing how to look at this database is, is going to be important. Before we do router 3 and 4, we've already seen what happens on this OSPF database. And we know that all routers in the same area have the same database, right? All the, all the information will match except for the ages are going to be slightly different, but uh, checksum, link count sequence number, you know, all that stuff is going to match because everyone has the same database. So let's predict what's going to happen. When I add router 3 to this network and I start OSPF, what am I going to get in this spot for router link states? Who can predict what will show up in, if I do show IP OSPF database, what's going to show up there? Correct. It's going to follow the same pattern. It's going to be 0003. It's going to have three links because it's going to be two fast Ethernet interfaces and um, you know, the loopback. Router 4, same deal, 0004. And whether it's three links or four links kind of depends on whether we put the serial link into OSPF which I think we, we probably will. Okay, so let's go on router 3. Conf T, router ID, or router OSPF1. We'll make that router ID 0003. Here we're going to cheat. We're just going to do all zeros. Area 0. 
and do the same thing on router 4. Just chuck everything into OSPF, router ID 0004. And the reason we're doing it on 3 and 4 with all zeros is uh, we want to save a little bit of time. We don't want to be doing this all night. I personally don't want to. I don't know about you, but we don't want to be here till midnight. So looking at R1, show IP OSPF database. You'll see that, uh, look at that, we got 0001 through 0004. Everyone's the same except uh, router 4, he's the black sheep because he's got a serial interface in OSPF. We got three network link states, so 12.1, 13.1. Notice the, the link IDs for these are the actual, the 12.1 is the DR, 13.1 is the DR, 24.2 is the DR. The advertising router remains the same as the, the router ID. But nothing, nothing much to this. And I should be able to ping everyone. So if I'm on router 1, ping 2222, ping 3333, ping 4444, and ping, I think it's uh, 2002, I think. Okay, yeah, 2002 is my side. 2001, oh, doesn't ping yet. And the reason for this is the backbone router doesn't have a route back to us. It doesn't know how to get to 10, 10, 12, 1. Okay, but we'll fix that soon. Actually, let's fix that now. So, ping 2002, that is our outside interface on our network. So, router 4 has a 000 interface. So, we can ping our, our end of things. The ping to 2001 fails. So if we go to the backbone router, BB1, let's show IP route. And you'll see that we have no route going to 10, 10, 12, anything. So the backbone router, that's the internet. That's your hosting provider or, or whoever, ISP. Let's say they have a default route back to you. So IP route, all zeros, all zeros. What would our next hop be? What would the ISP's next hop be to you? Yep, 200002. And, and never think that just because this is the ISP, just because this is uh, cogent or level three, never assume that they're so godlike that they don't make any mistakes. They do. Just because you're the lowly customer and they're the ISP, it doesn't make them uh, gods. So always feel free to call them out if you think something's wrong. Okay, go to R1, hit the up arrow, ping 2001, and the ping comes back. So before, your pings were reaching BB1. They just didn't know how to get back to you. Now that you've added a default route uh, to BB1, you're okay. Now, if you notice, BB1's got a loopback. So if you go on BB1, show IP interface brief, 8888. Who knows what 8888 is in real life? What is that? Sys admins should know that is their DNS. So Google changed their interface a little bit for Google Hangouts, so... It looks a lot different today than before, especially on the Google Plus page. Okay, so before we got booted out, so BB1 has a loop back. It's the 888 address. If I go on R1 and I ping 8888, 
we have no connection to it. Doesn't get there. And the reason is very simple. If I show IP route on any of my four routers, I got OSPF routes, but I don't have anything to 8888. I also don't have a default route. Now, if I were being paid by the hour, what options do I have in getting connectivity to 8888 and anything else on the internet? What would be a very manual process of getting connectivity on all four of my internal routers to that? Static routes everywhere, yep, that's option. Default routes everywhere. Stat so I can go on all four routers and make uh, static routes. And this will work. I mean, I can, I can go on R1 and I can say, uh, this is going to be ugly. Well, I could say IP route, 8888-255-255-255. And next top of 10, 10, 12, uh, 2, let's say. And then I could go on R2 and say IP route, 8888, all 255s, next top towards router 4. And then on router 4, check it out to the internet. So multiple static routes. What a pain in the butt. Okay. So instead, let's do this. R4 has our connection to the internet. So let's make the default route on R4 to get out to the internet first. Okay, so R4 needs to get out to the internet. Let's go IP route, all zeros, all zeros. Next top is going to be 200, 0, 0, 1. So R4 is going to put in a default route. This is the same thing that uh, that your DSL or cable modem or files or whatever, this is the same thing that your router does at home. If it doesn't know where to send it, it's going to chuck it out to the next top on the internet. So throw your default route on R4. And on R4, you can ping all eights. So you can ping Google now. So Roosevelt James has a question. Is it possible to set a static route to a cheapo Linksys or D-Link? So if you have a Cisco router and you want to connect it to a Linksys, yeah, your router doesn't care what you're connected to. The router will blindly, you know, you could set your static route to point to an IP. It just cares about an IP address. Okay, so R4 can get out to the internet with a static default route. So cool. Now we want to tell the rest of our network about this awesome information, right? So let's, on R1, let's debug IP routing. We want to see routing changes. So looking at our diagram here, R4, right here, can send to the internet it can also receive from the internet. None of these other routers can do it. Now we could manually do it, but there's a command in OSPF where we basically turn R4 into a magnet. So you're basically saying, dude, send all your shit to me. If you don't know how to get there, send it to me. Yes, it's going to be default information originate. So basically what you've done is you've turned R4, after you type this command in, you're going to turn it into Jessica Alba. 
everyone's going to want to go to R4. So default information originate, just go ALBA. Remember that, and you'll never forget it. So let's go on R4. Conf T, router OSPF1. Default, and you can see just by doing the question mark, default dash information originate. And then we got a couple options here. I can type enter, or I could put in always and a bunch of other stuff that you'll need for CCMP and CCIE. But for now, default information originate. Let's just hit enter and see what happens. Yeah, enter. Let's go over to router one. And you'll see that we've added all zeros next top of 1010.13.3. And router three is gonna send you to router four. We also have something coming the other way all zeros going to router two. So why do you think R1 here got all zeros coming from R2 and another one coming from R3? Why did we get two? The answer is actually pretty simple. R4 told R2, R4 also told R3. And then 2 and 3 just propagated out to R1. So let's take a look at the routing table. Show IP route. And we got all zeros slash zero. That's a default route. 10, 10, 13, 3, 10, 10, 12, 2. And basically we have uh, two equal cost ways of getting out to the internet. So now I should be able to ping 8888. Yeah, so let's see what happens if I trace it. Trace 8888, trace 8888. Keep in the up arrow, you'll see that it oscillates between 13.3 and 12.2. Not too bad. So now just for verification, we know that the default routes on R1, let's go to R3, show IP route. So we have a default route here, right? So that single command popped default routes everywhere. Well, we know it's already on R4. I manually typed it in there. It's not gonna be on BB1. He's not connected to us with OSPF. But if you go to R2, show IP route, we have a default route everywhere. So default information originate. Think of it as a magnet. Everyone's going towards that one router. So that's a handy, very handy command. Now you may be asking yourself, okay, I know that on R4 I had to put in that static route, but what if my link to the internet dies? Well, let's try it. Let's go interface zero, zero, zero. We are going to cut R link to the internet. This is basically us pulling the DSL cable. So shut that puppy down. And we're going to wait a little bit. And see, let's see what happened here. Now we had a couple things. We deleted 200, 0, 0, 0. We deleted our default route. So it looks like it deleted both the default route and our connection to internet. Now, why did it delete this one, do you think? 
why do you think it deleted the 200? Let's take a look at our diagram. That guy right there. All right, so we shut down the link and we shut it down and OSPS said, well, I guess you really didn't need to go out 200.00.0. So it killed the link. Your link was the interface for the default route. The router said, well, didn't need that default route. So now if we go to router one, show IP route, you'll see that all zeros is not there anymore. So default information originate means if that link dies, then the default route also dies. We are good so far. Any questions about this? Now this sh should make sense because if your main link to the internet dies, then it kind of makes sense. Okay, well, not even it's not even worth it to send it to R4. So instead of Jessica Alba, it's turned into Margaret Thatcher, and, you know, we don't want to go that way. Okay, now if we want to stick this route in there permanently, so no matter what happens to the link, we always get an all zeros route, then we can do this. Let's go back to R4. We'll no shut serial 00. zero. We get our all zeros route back. You know, we can ping all eights. Life is good. So now what we'll do is we'll go into router OSPF on R4. We'll do default dash information originate and the word always. We could add other stuff, but here we'll hit enter. And so now we'll show IP route just for grins, just so we see all zeros, so we're good. Go back to R4 and shut down that serial interface, and you'll see that everything should still have all your routers inside should still have all zeros route. Right, still have the all zeros route. Now we can we can try to trace the all eights. And what we get here, two thousand and whoa. Oh, I I know shut that guy. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I should shut it down. There we go. Okay, interface is down. Now you'll see that we do lose 200. Okay, we do lose the link to 200, and that's that's to be expected. The interface is shut down, but we still have the all zeros route. So now my trace to all eights it's going to bomb out at router 4. All right, so 24.4, it dies out. And that, that should make sense because our link to the internet is toast. Show IP route again. Okay, go back to R4, no shut, serial zero, zero. 
Now looking at our diagram, you see that we have two equal ways of getting out to the internet, R1 and R3. Let's assume here that this connection between R1 and R3 costs a lot of money. Or we can imagine that you have a sneaking suspicion that the link between R1 and R3 has the NSA on it. And they are tapping that line. I don't know how you found out, but we'll just assume that they're on that line. So you really don't want to send traffic that way, but you're load balancing. You know, show IP route. You can see from these last two lines, you are sending two things out. You're connecting. So why are we seeing two entries? It's because we've got this. That one there is cost of one. So OSPF will send out a link with the lowest cost. So if I want to prefer one way versus the other, I can't get it lower than one. So I have to make one side higher. So looking at our diagram, we know that right now our, oh, that link has a cost of one, that link has a cost of one. We know it likes to prefer the, the lowest cost one, so which link would I want to change to make the router prefer the top link towards R2. Remember, we want to avoid R3 at all costs. We want to go through R2. So we want to go to the bottom with the higher cost, correct. So here's what we want to do. Go R1 and make sure we're on the right interface, FAST01, interface FAST01. Command is very easy. IP OSPF cost. So what do you need to set it to? Well, really anything, anything higher than one will work. But I suggest when you set cost that you make it a number that you can um, easily recognize, especially if you're on the lab, uh, CCIE lab. Make it a number that really shouldn't come up anywhere else, like. 8765, let's say I'm just throwing it out there. That way, towards the end of your lab when you're doing some verification, and let's say this was a troubleshooting step you were playing around with to get traffic going places, and uh, now it's come time to take this off. And you have a brain fart, and you can't remember which router you popped this on, you could just quickly you know, show run pipe I 8765 on all your routers and switches, and just to find that particular line, you know, if you were, you know, you just couldn't remember. Or do IP OSPF cost 666, you know, something like that, 777, 888, something like that. Okay, so we're making the bottom link cost a lot more. And so now if I show IP route, things go nuts. Now my default route goes through the top link, right? Any questions about adding cost to get us to prefer another link? So yeah, so the cost is the, kind of the easy way of doing it. We can always go the other way. If we change the speed of the link, it will also change the cost. And Chris Reed is also correct. Now what's going to happen is if we want to reach R3 over here from R1, 
it's now going to go this way. Because we added a cost over here on this link. This is a really bad link. It's got Satan's number on it, 666. We don't like it. NSA is there. We're avoiding it at all costs. So if I try to ping 3333, it's going to go the long way around. And we could verify that if we go on R1, trace 3333. It's going to go to router 2 then hit router 4, then hit router 3. But we can, we can change this. One of the ways we can change it is we can make it with a better, we can put, let's see here, well, Here's what we should remember here. If I show IP route, when we changed the priority or when we changed the cost, it added a cost on this link. It made it really, really crazy on that link. Right? Everything coming through that link is really, really nuts. If I want a shortcut, a more direct way to 3333, can I use a static route to get there? Yeah. I can always use a static route. Static route in real life is probably one of your most powerful tools. Most powerful, easiest, and probably the nuclear option sometimes. So I could do you know, if I want to reach 3333, specify the next top, 10, 10, 13, 3. And now just make sure I can ping it. So we're good there. And then trace to all threes. And I have a direct connection there. Right? So there we're just bypassing OSPF because now show IP route static got a static route beats OSPF no matter what the cost so on R4 we've got our connection to the internet we've gotten connectivity on our internal network with uh, default information originate we also put a static route on R4 to get it out to the internet so we've taken care of that now the problem is on R4 is if we start a debug IP OSPF hello and we wait a little bit. You'll notice that we are sending out hellos out on serial zero zero. Now what is the what is the downside of this? Sending the hellos out to serial zero zero. Yeah, I'm telling the world that uh, I'm running OSPF and if someone starts OSPF out there then on the next hop then uh, I'll talk to it, which is not, not good. So if I want to run OSPF here, so I, I still want to tell router 1, router 2, router 3, I still want all of these guys to reach that link. And I want all of my routers to reach that link but I don't want BB1 to know about OSPF here. I don't want to send out hellos, but I still want connectivity to that guy. Then I could do this. I could use passive interface. So stop our debugs there. So this is done under OSPF, passive interface. If you do question mark, you get an option to put in interfaces. Now, the Hail Mary approach, passive interface default, this will stop OSPF hellos on all your interfaces until you 
explicitly put a network command to turn it on. So why would you do this? Well, if you had a router with lots of interfaces, this might be a good idea. But for now, we're going to say passive interface 0, 0, 0. And you just hit enter there. And now if you debug IP OSPF allows on router 4, you'll see that you're not sending out hellos out that interface. You're still sending out fast 00 and fast 01. That's not a problem. But as far as the serial interface, you're not sending anything out. And if you go on R1, you should still be able to ping 2000.001 or 200.001 and 2000.002. Okay, so we have a question here from Justin. Is the other option just to use the interface OSPF command on the inside interface instead of the neighbor command? So are you talking about this? So let's stop our debug. So are you talking about going into 000 and doing this, IP OSPF 1 area 0? Okay, so I think I, I think I understand where you're, where you're trying to get to. So instead of doing a passive interface, so let's take off the passive interface. So now the question is, do we actually need to run OSPF here? We don't necessarily need to run OSPF here. It does make our life a little bit easier because by running OSPF here we're telling everyone how to get there so all of my internal routers know how to get to BB1 automatically. So let me just show you what happens if we don't run OSPF on that link. So first of all show run pipe B OSPF so begin where OSPF starts and so we have a problem here we threw everything into OSPF. So we're going to we're going to need to fix that. So router OSPF1 no network all zeros all zeros area 0. So right now nothing is running OSPF on router 4. We're going to do exact match 10 10 24 4 0 0 0 0 area 0. And network 10, 10, 34, 4, area 0. So now we're just running OSPF on our internal interfaces, not running it towards R4. So now let's see what happens. We'll go to R1, show IP route. So you can see a couple things here. We still have our default route out to R4. So that part's cool. We've lost our route to the 200 network. So if I try to ping 200.001. Now before we hit ping, notice that while we don't have an exact way of getting to 200.001, what do you still have that may get us out to that link?
yeah, we have a default route. So the default route gets us to R2, R2 gets us to R4, and R4 is going to know how to get to 200, 001. So let's see, let's hit ping. We have a success, so that's good. So while we don't have a specific way of getting to 200, 001 and 200, 002, so basically 200, 000 slash 24. We don't know exactly how to get there, but the default route helps us out. So correct. We don't necessarily need to run OSPF on that link. But what if the default route jacked up? What if somehow the default route disappeared? Then our 200 ping to 200 001 is going to bomb out. So yeah, you have the option not to run OSPF. You also have the option to do passive interface. Any questions about that? Yeah, you can use the interface OSPF command. It works. It does the same thing as the network command. Yeah, that's fine. It will accomplish the same thing. Correct. Okay, let's go on R4, show IP OSPF database. And you can see we have a type 5 LSA now. We've not seen a type 5, this is the first time we've seen it. It's an external link state. So when we made this default information originate, we're basically telling our OSPF network, hey, to get to the outside, to get to something not known by OSPF, we're going to hit this information. Basically, you're saying router 4 is making this, and it's 0000. We can check this out by doing show IP OSPF database and the word external, and this will give us more information. And you can see router 4 is telling routers 1, 2, and 3, and any other any other OSP routers that come up. We've got a forwarding address of all zeros, which is fine. Not a problem. It's going to cost us one and metric type of two. Metric type, you'll, I don't know if they get into metric types in CCNA, but there's going to be a Let's take a look actually at what this metric type does. And for CCNA guys, I'm, I don't want to make a positive statement, but I'm somewhat assured or somewhat, uh, I hope that they don't get into metric types in CCNA, but you never know. So if we go to R1, show IP route, you'll see that this cost is one didn't change as it went through your network. Oh, we should probably change that uh, IP OSPF cost on that interface on R1. Let's change it back. So show run interface. So just show me the configuration on fast01. So we're going to get rid of this IP OSPF cost 666. So go back into interface fast01. No IP OSPF cost 666, and that will reset it. And now if you hit the up arrow back to show IP route, there we go. So your two ways of getting to the default router back, 
one one. Now, how many of you remember what the default cost is on a fast Ethernet link? So, how much will the link between router one and router two cost by default? Fast Ethernet. 100 meg, 100 meg link. And if you didn't know, you could just go to R1, show IP OSPF interface brief. Right here you see cost of one. Right. If it was a 10 meg link, it would be a cost of 10. So it uses 100 meg as what they call their auto cost reference bandwidth, the reference bandwidth. So this was back in the days, if you had a fast Ethernet link, you were considered badass. Nothing can be faster than you, so they assigned it a 1. But wait a minute. The total cost of getting from here to here, router 1 to router 4, is actually two links, so it really should be 1, 2. Right. So, but we're not seeing that. We're just seeing a cost of one. That's because when you inject something in with a metric type of two, it doesn't change. So it got injected in, yes, correct, as an E2. Cost doesn't change. It stays a one throughout your network. And if we change it, Maybe we can get that one to change to a two. So let's see if we could do that. Go on R4, conf T, go back into OSPF, and default dash information originate, do that question mark, and you can see metric type. So metric type, question mark. So you're a two by default. Let's change it to a one. Now, whenever you're doing default information originate, always, 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 don't assume that this default information originate command that you just typed in is the only line there. If you've been typing in this command in different variations, you could have old configs that stick. So it's always good, right after you do this, to show run pipe B OSPF. Okay, so here we, we're good. Default information originate, always metric type one. Can't tell you how many times in the CCIE meetings we're doing OSPF and we're just typing like crazy. And we assume, or some of us assume that, oh, I typed the last command in, it should work. And when we show run, there's like multiple route maps there and multiple access. There's like just a whole bunch of crap there. So don't assume your command cancels out the other command automatically. Okay, metric type one. We go to R1. Show IP route. We have a metric type of three. So it came in as one and it looks like we added one for each hop. So... We started off, whoa, we started off as one over here. Then we added one, we added one, finally get to R1 and it costs three. All right. So we can change the cost for default routes, okay? We have this cost as three. What do you think would happen if, let's say, we got another internet connection? Let's say out R3. So let's say we got another internet connection. We made a default route going out this way.
and we wanted to have uh, you know some failover so just in case like if R4 dies then we go to R3 do you think we could also do a default information originate on R3 can we do it on multiple routers in our network We have one person saying yes, we have one person saying no. Well, let's try. Let's go on router three. Let's go on router three. Well, let's try it. Now, first of all, we probably want to make a loopback that simulates a link some, somewhere. So interface loopback 99, IP route 9999999. Nine, and we'll make it a slash 32. IP address, right? So 999999, all 99s. So, and now we're going to make a default route pointing out towards that guy. Or actually, let's do this. IP route, all zeros, all zeros, loop back 99. So that's going to simulate our internet connection. Doesn't actually go anywhere, but we're faking it. We go to router OSPF. One. And let's see what happens if we type in default information originate. Now we have to remember something. Default information originate. We got we got a default route coming from R4. We're also trying to make we just typed in a static default route on R3. So sticking on R3, show IP route. Let's see who won out of that one. So when we made the default route on R3, what did it knock out in our routing table? Yeah, it knocked out the OSPF default route. Correct, because OSPF has a cost or the, the administrative distance is 110. And the static cost is definitely a lot lower. And so static cost wins. Okay. So Mohammed, uh, we explained what default information originate and always uh, meant. So just watch the video again, and it's about 10 minutes before. So on R3, we're, we're OK. It's to be expected. Static wins, and then we put in the default information originate. Let's see what happens on R1. Notice R1, he gets the route towards 999999. That's because we're running OSPF, show uh, network all zeros, all zeros. We chucked everything into OSPF. Now if I show IP route, let's see what happens. So we have uh, E1 route, we have coming from 10, 10, 13, 3, 10, 10, 12, 1. They both have a cost of 3. Now, if I'm seeing a cost of 3, I'm not getting the default route from where? Oh, yeah. Look at that. Yeah, we forgot about that, didn't we? Look at that. Remember that configuration we did about 20 minutes ago? So this could be interfering with our stuff. Possibly. Okay, so this static route, let's take out the static route. Let's see if we get show IP route static. Conf T. 
no IP route 3333. I think we added it as a 255. 10, 10, 13, 3. Show IP route static. Okay, so all of our static routes are gone, so that's good. Show IP route again. Okay, so that was just to that loopback zero. So I had nothing to do with loopback 99. So look at that. Okay, so that's our that's our routing table. Let's take a look at our database. Show IP OSPF database. So in our database, we're seeing a default LSA, type 5 LSA from router 3 and router 4. We're getting the LSA, but then your router does what to all of the LSAs? It picks the what. So here's where you have to be careful. Why did router 4 win? Why did router 4 win? They're both external. They're both uh, type 5 externals. We know that cost isn't doing it because router 4's cost is 3. Router 3's cost is still 1. Well, let's take a look. Show IP OSPF database, external. Let's see what the difference is. Router 3, metric type of 2. Router 4, metric type of 1. So let's play around with this a little bit. Router 4 wins on this one. Let me prove to you that the metric types have something to do with this. Or we can, we can rule it in or rule it out. Go to R4, R3. Let's go to R3. Conf T, router, OSPF1. We're going to change the default information originate metric type. Let's also change it to one. So both are going to be one. Okay, so I change it. Something happened here. I had debug IP routing still in there. I deleted the one coming from router 2, which started at router 4. And now I'm seeing 2. I'm seeing the 1 coming from router 3. It has a metric of 2. And the reason was, reason for 2, is it started out here as 1 plus 1 right here, which equals 2. This guy coming from router 4, it's 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 3. They're both metric type of 1. It's the same metric type. So when it's the same metric type, then the cost comes into play. So metric type of 1 beats a metric type of 2. Do you guys see that? Metric type of 1 beats a metric type of 2 no matter what the cost. So here you can see you can have multiple routers doing default information originate. There's nothing stopping you from typing it in. Now the only question is whether they ask, this is two completely different questions. So 
what's in your routing table versus what's in your OSPF database. Your OSPF database is going to contain everything. Your routing table then picks the winner out of there. So you could, I could go on all four routers right here. I would be stupid, but I can go here, 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 and here. I could do default information originate on all four. Nothing stops me from doing default information originate always on all four. OSPF is going to show four quad zero routes or quad zero LSAs, but my routing table is only going to have one default route in there. Right? Any questions about all of that? Okay, so I think that's probably it for tonight. Next week, we're going to do multi-area OSPF. We're probably going to do, let's see what, uh, we're going to go to this bad boy right here. Topology 11, basic OSPF. So there's a .NET on the Router Gods page. You can click on that. Or that's that's the diagram. But in the topologies page, let's, let's just make sure here. Basic OSPF, zipped .NET and router configs, yes. So let me just copy that. There you go. That dot zip is all you need. And it will be this. We'll be doing uh, multi-area OSPF and all the goodness there. We'll be playing more with the E2, E1 routes. Uh, it's the same time. Just look at the calendar. And it should be fun. We'll be doing a lot more of the redistribution. And we'll be getting into different, uh, well, since it's the first time with multi-area, we're getting into stub and not so stubby and all that stuff. All right, let me stop the recording, and then you guys can ask your questions away that uh, you were too afraid to ask. So hold on for a second.